uh, we have been discussing about uh, various experimental techniques. What is the physical principle behind the experimental technique? See, I have been saying if you have a problem on hand, you may not be able to solve all the quantities that you want by using one experimental technique. You may have to use multiple experimental techniques in a generic sense. I have shown that people have combined strain gauges and brittle coatings, so that they could do and solve industrial problems very quickly. And we have also seen if I want to find out uh, separation of stresses, interferometric technique and photoelasticity could be combined. On the other hand, people also thought of recording this information simultaneously, such equipments also have come. One is use and perform experiments separately, then process the information. And once you decide that these are the two information I want, people also devise new equipments wherein they could either simultaneously record or record one after another with the same optical arrangement with, with modification of what you want to insert. Such an development has also been seen in combining method of caustics and coherent gradient sensor. So, such information available in the literature. And now, what we move on to do this is, well, let us have a very interesting discussion on naming of experimental methods. You may wonder, name can signify many things. You know, if you look at the, the development of languages, if you look at uh, Sanskrit, even for nouns, they find out a root and then they explain because of such and such reason, reason this is named like this. And it is a very well uh, developed and scientifically, it has a grammar which is scientifically uh, proven and people find it easy for implementation in the computer. In fact, for natural language processing, Sanskrit grammar is so convenient, you can translate from one Indian language to another language, the intermediary is Sanskrit and then go to it. And if you look at, you know, if, because we are looking at naming of experimental technique, let us also look at what way names are given in Sanskrit. I will give you an example. In Sanskrit, the sabda is very important and the phonetic rendition of the word has some idea of what the word connotes. And if you want to uh, talk about the tooth, the Sanskrit name for this dantam and you will be surprised if you do not have a tooth, you cannot pronounce it. It is very interesting. You know, the, san, the why you say Sanskrit is so perfect, I am not getting into you know language division and things like that. When there is a positive and scientific aspect attached to a particular language, as scientists, we should recognize uh, that merit. And it is so interesting, it is dantam you call it, I can call the tooth by a, several different uh, uh, names and the phonetic rendition has a link to the meaning or what it connotes. So, if you are uh, not having an understanding, then you can find out and think about it and go to the root and find out what the meaning is. So, it is not arbitrarily named. So, dantam you pronounce it, you need tooth for it and it is a tooth it indicates. Now, let us look at have we named our experimental technique scientifically. Okay. And if you look at one of the first uh, technique was photoelasticity. And uh, there is a discussion, you know, there is no unique approach to name an experimental method. And if you look at 1930s, one of the earliest optical methods that came into existence was photoelasticity. Why you call it as photoelasticity? People have used optical methods to reveal the stresses. So, they have combined optics and stresses. And photography was also prevalent at that time when they were recording the information. So, they instead of combining optics and elasticity, they called it as photoelasticity, they call it as photo mechanics. And even now there is a debate, should we call it as uh, photoelasticity or photo mechanics or opto mechanics. There is a school of uh, scientists who feel we have to go and rename all the techniques and because, because we are using optics, why do not we call it as optomechanics. 
So, if you look at photoelasticity, you have just combined the sensor optics is used as a sensor and you are analyzed for elastic problem. So, you call it as optoelasticity, photoelasticity. So, that is how you have named it. And when you come to strain gauges, what do you do? And this is what I caution because people named it as strain gauges, there is a danger that you get strain tensor. It is not so, it measures only a component of strain. Because it basically measures strain, they have called it as strain gauge. And if you go to strain gauge literature, you find special grid configurations where you find out the stresses. So, you call that a stress gauge, you have shear stress gauge, torque gauge, likewise you name it. So, strain gauge has got its name from this. Then you have holography and holography it is named after what it records. And what we find here is, I have mentioned that holography records both intensity and phase of the object wavefront. Holo means whole or full, because I record both the information together following the example of photography, they called it as holography. And you have also seen it is a very fundamental contribution to the scientific community. So, whoever has developed the holography, he got the Nobel Prize for it. It is such a very important uh, development. And then what you have? You also have uh, techniques where you use the physics. I said that in the method of caustics, you employ the principle of caustics in the formation of the shadow and you name it directly as method of caustics. And whenever you have a two grid superimposed, you get moire fringes seen and you call that as moire. Similarly, wherever you use speckles, speckles are formed on the diffusely reflecting surface, specularly reflecting surface, you qualify the surface. And when you use those, you call those methods as speckle methods. And when we go to digital image correlation, it uses white light speckle, but you call it by a different approach. And we have also seen coating techniques. What we have seen? We have seen brittle coatings, we have seen birefringent coating. Why do I call it as brittle coating? I have a coat that is put on the on the model it fails in a brittle fashion. In fact, when brittle coating was originally developed, they were all used for finding out plastic deformation. And when you have a rolled steel, you have scales that are formed. So, they flaked like uh, um, a brittle coat. So, they were able to identify zones of plastic deformation. That is how the whole technique developed. So, you name that technique based on how the coating behaves. I said photoelastic coating, other name of photoelastic coating is birefringent coating. And I said in photoelasticity, the physics used is temporary or artificial birefringence and that is what is exhibited, exhibited by this coating. So, you call it as photoelastic coating as well as birefringent coating. And we have also have another technique thermoelastic stress analysis and I cautioned you again and again do not misconstrue that this technique can measure stresses due to thermoelasticity. It is not so, the physical principle used employs measurement of temperature which is very very small and you call this as a thermoelastic stress analysis. So, it is based on the physical principle and I said I have one of the emerging techniques now is digital image correlation. It uses white light speckles, however, this is named after the method of data processing. 
I have digital images and then I look at undeformed and deformed configuration and then do a correlation. So, I call this as digital image correlation. So, techniques are named differently. I do not have a unique approach and if somebody wants to develop a new technique, he coins what is more appropriate and what you see in coherent gradient sensor, why the technique is called coherent gradient sensor. If you look at that, I use a coherent source of light, it is essentially a sharing interferometer by combining the nature of light source and the type of information it can provide, the technique is named. And you know, you know researchers also want uh, attention to their work. So, one of the reasons why they coin uh, a technique is to attract the attention of others to look at what this technique is all about. So, coherent gradient sensor is very famously known as CGS, which is essentially a sharing interferometer. Now, people call it as sharing interferometer, that is how they, because it has become a general purpose uh, analysis tool, people do it for uh, thin wafers in uh, when you go for MEMS application, thin wafers are analyzed for out of plane displacement, slope, curvature. So, you have this, so I combine the type of radiation that I use, I have a coherent uh, source of light and I measure the gradient, so I call it as a coherent gradient sensor. Next we move on to a very important aspect, which we have also seen uh, and discussed a little bit earlier. What we looked at was uh, in most of the optical techniques, you get fringe patterns and we need to understand certain issues about how these fringe patterns are. First, what I need to do is, I need to find out whether the interpretation what I do for the fringes is acceptable or not. A simple exercise is compare it with an analytical solution. If the comparison is correct, then you understand that this is what the technique gives. The other approach is look at the physics of the problem, find out what all the physics can reveal, then come and link that this is what the technique is capable of giving. And what we find in the case of beam underbending, we have looked at the central portion and then we said we will plot contours of sigma 1 minus sigma 2, the analytical solution turned out to be horizontal lines. When I look at the experiment what happens, I get this as horizontal lines, but they are not thin lines, I have a band, I have a band, but nevertheless I got horizontal contours. And we said why you see that as a band is because of the limitations of the recording medium, one observes a fringe contour as a band. And all optical techniques you will see only a band. And one of the most challenging and difficult aspect for any experimental analysis is how to go and number these fringes because I need to know the fringe order, then I need to use the appropriate equation and find out what is it that I will have to interpret on. And what do you find here, instead of a monochromatic light source, if I view these patterns in a white light source, I get not black and white contours, but contours with color, contours with distinctive color and this is the specific advantage of photoelasticity. So, what I could do is by knowing the color, it is possible for you to find out the fringe order. It is also easy for you to identify how the gradient information changes, how the gradient information changes, whether it is increasing in this direction or decreasing in this direction, you can find out whether the color is, color sequence is repeating in a particular fashion whether the color sequence repeats in a particular fashion, then you can identify positive gradient and negative gradient, all that you can find out. So, one of the most challenging aspect 
is quantitative extraction of data from all these experimental techniques. But the focus of our attention now is to find out richness of qualitative information that you could get from Finch patterns, because this gives you a sense of comfort in looking at and interpreting the fringe patterns. Let us look at what we have seen is fringe is a band, we have seen it and mere record of the fringe patterns itself can provide useful qualitative information. So, we will have to look at what all the qualitative information that you could identify. One of the things what you could see is I get it as a band and if you look the fringe patterns closely are the bands of uniform thickness. The thickness of the band is inversely related to the gradient or the variable it represents. So, that we will see, we will see I have a fringe pattern from photoelasticity because photoelasticity has information in color, a colored fringe pattern is taken and I also have a fringe pattern in moire and what we will have is, we will have a closer look at how the fringe thickness varies and this just shows that for you to draw your attention, you have this fringe patterns drawn earlier, go back and then look at that fringe contour is not of same thickness, the thickness changes and that is what is tried to be shown in this slide and you have a very broad fringe here. And let me repeat, I have very sharp fringes here and the same fringe becomes increasing in thickness. So, essentially what you find is that fringe band is not of constant thickness and I mentioned in one of the classes you have this uh, fringe plotting by a software, when you have to go and mimic what is the way to get the fringe band, one of the information you use it variation in the variable, even if you give a constant variation in the variable, because the gradient changes automatically the thickness of the fringes changes, when the gradient is small fringe is very broad, when the gradient is very high fringe is very sharp. So, I can find out by looking at the fringe patterns, whether the gradient or the information is high or low, I can find out from the thickness. And this is not a property of photoelastic fringes, you see a similar one even in moire. I go to moire and then look at it, you see this a very sharp thickness increases, thickness increases and that is how you find and the same fringe has thick and thin it is thinner here, it is thicker at the corner and this becomes much thicker. So, when you look at the fringe pattern, observe for all these indirect information. The fringe pattern speaks to you, this is how the distribution is. So, take note of it, suppose I have fringes closely packed, then I would say that this is the zone of high stress concentration. Later on I can go and do a technique, do a quantitative processing and try to get the actual data, that is a different issue. But the moment you look at a fringe pattern, you should react to it, you should know that this is stress concentration region and this is the region where I can scoop out material, I need to get that kind of information and you get that by looking at the thickness of the band, as simple as that. So, this is one of the qualitative information you get. Then what is the other information that you can think of? <coughs> I have said that density of fringe contours indicate that the value of the variable it represents is quite high in that zone. Suppose I want to compare two different designs and the ideal way is take the fringe pattern for both the cases and compare the fringe pattern and find out based on qualitative appreciation, how you can evaluate the different design. 
So, it is used as an optical comparator and one simple example is given and what you find here is I have a example of two different type of spanners and in one case I have given this as a streamlined fillet. Let us understand what is the uh, idea here and uh, you all have uh, you are all mechanical engineers. So, you know how a fillet is made, how a fillet is made suppose I go to any machining process it is easier to make a circular fillet because the machining operation is simple I can go and make a circular fillet and why do I make a fillet I would like to minimize the sharp geometric changes and then I would like to have a smooth variation and this smooth variation you could do by a fillet. So, you essentially reduce the stress concentration and if you look at forging operations or casting operations when you look at forging or casting I do not have the restriction of having only a circular fillet I am not doing a machining in a machining operation circular fillet simplifies your fabrication of the component when I go for casting and forging I have the luxury of choosing any type of fillet I want non circular fillets are more common in those applications and how do they arrive at such odd shaped fillets and you have an example here and what you find here I have this uh, contour like this and I can also enlarge it further and what you find here the fringes are many in this zone they are not tangential to the boundary. I would like you to make a sketch of it I would like you to make a sketch of it and this is a example problem that is shown I have one circular fillet here I have another circular fillet here I have another circular fillet here they are not joined you so you do not have a smooth transition here and when I make a spanner out of it I find in this zone the fringes are not tangential to the boundary and you focus only on this region you do not have to focus on the other regions make a neat sketch of bring out that the fringes are not tangential. So, when you have a fringe pattern you have to look at very closely and try to extract as much information as possible and obviously, I have a load application point I have fringes originate here. So, it also indicates a stress concentration zone and what I find here is as such when you see only one design you will only see oh these colors are good the fringes are good that is the way you will interpret only when you see a counter example you will find that the knowledge is different. Now, what I will do is I will go and show the other one then come back to this okay, so that you will know what is the difference. Now, I take this example and what I find here the contour is the fillet is smooth it is non circular here and you find more or less these fringes are tangential to the boundary it merges with the boundary it merges with the boundary of this and these are called streamlined fillets. So, only when you see the difference you will know what is the advantage and they are very strong they are very strong you need to concentrate only on the do not worry about the nut you concentrate only on this region where I am showing the arrow you need to worry about the fringes you find the fringes are parallel to the boundary by and large as some small aberration is there here, but compared to the earlier one here the fringes are lot more smoother and parallel to the boundary and in fact, when people design some of those castings and forgings they take a photo elastic model which is uh, uh, slightly large in shape and then keep on shaving the material until for the given loading you get the fringe tangential to the boundary. In fact, there is a famous book uh, by Hayward designing by photo elasticity where he talks about how to get a streamlined fillet and when you get a streamlined fillet 
the component will have very high strength, nothing happens to the component and I can afford to have a streamlined fillet which is not always circular in a forging and casting, there is no problem and you know this uh, spanners are done by forging. So, I can afford to have a non circular fillet and take advantage of our understanding of stress distribution. So, let us see this fringe pattern one after another, I see this as tangential to the boundary and I go back and then uh, show the other one, you will find that this is different and this is a fictitious example, you know you do not have a spanner uh, like this, this is done to illustrate, I have a combination of circular fillets here. So, when I do is, I have lot of deviation from this and this is not strong, you can have failure initiated in this and in service it can fail. So, what you do is, I do not do a quantitative analysis, even a simple qualitative exercise can help you to improve your design. So, this is another aspect of richness of qualitative information. Okay. In a production line, you know I have a pro, I have like to inspect whether my component is being manufactured correctly or not. I can have a optical comparator and what we are going to look at is insertion of a bush in a circular hole, this is what we are going to look at as an example. So, what we are going to look at is how fringe patterns helps you to check the quality of the finished product. What I am going to do in a quality checking uh, mode, I will accept or reject based on some evaluation of fringe patterns and I have a example here, I have one example where I have a perfectly circular bush inserted in an annular plate and you all know Lamy's problem, you need to get concentric fringes, I do get concentric fringes and this is not what happens in an actual production line. In an actual production line, if you do not maintain the cylindricity of the bush, you can have surprises like this and what I see here, I see extra flowery pattern and let us look at little more closely here. So, what I have here is, I have bush is cylindrical, you can go and accept the component. And while you sketch it, what you do is, you do not have to draw all these fringes, you say essentially they are concentric. And when I have a non-circular bush, which has undulations which are not visible to the naked eye, but when I insert, I get this flowery patterns on the inner boundary. I have inserted a bush in a circular hole it should behave like a Lamy's problem, concentric circles I should get, but instead what I get is, I get fringe pattern like this and in this case the deviation is quite obvious, it is very striking, the fringe pattern what I find is very striking, I can quickly say something has gone wrong. If the variations are very subtle, then I cannot make a judgment. In fact, one of the most difficult thing is, if you have a member and stretch it, invariably if the mem member is not stretched correctly, you will always have some amount of bending and if you take a specimen which can respond optically, any small misalignment will show up in the optical fringe pattern. So, experiments, simple experiments are really very difficult to conduct, even a simple tension. So, one of the ideas what they suggest is, if you have a situation where you need to verify the alignment, go for optical techniques and improve your alignment based on that. So, opti optical elements are very good, they are very sensitive to any one of this loading peculiarities. And what we see here, you have concentric fringes and you have the fringes which are coming as a flower. 
and that is what you have. I want you to make a reasonable sketch to bring out these difference, that is the idea. You have a flowery pattern and you have a concentric circle and that gives you an idea that something has gone wrong and you can take corrective action. You can go and modify your production line, inspect the how the product is made, go and improve the process parameters. So, you can take some kind of corrective action. So, now you realize that by looking at mere fringe patterns, we have extracted quite a bit of data. We can find out stress concentration zone, we can compare different designs, we can also accept or reject a component based on some of this information. So, that is quite useful, I mean we have been able to take note of this. And another advantage what you have is, I have a defect here, what I have is I have a plate with a hole and I have a coating put on this and you know here I have taken example, so I know that there is a hole present and now I am interpreting that you have a hole that is seen in the fringe pattern. In fact, to find out internal flaws, people have attempted putting a photoelastic coating and when the model is loaded, the fringe signature can identify presence of flaws in the member. So, this is another approach, people have used it and identifying a flaw in a structure is a very challenging aspect. And what is the difference between an ultrasonic technique in an ultrasonic technique even benign flaws will be detected, because it will only look at material separation. On the other hand, if I have a technique where the model is loaded, those flaws which are sensitive, which can pose problem to you, only those will be revealed. See, collecting lot of information is not necessary, you need pertinent information for a given problem. So, this is one of the reasons they cite if you use a acoustic emission technique, you are searching a needle in a haystack, because you get so much information, identifying your pertinent information is extremely difficult. So, on the other hand, if I have a technique which can reveal those flaws which are going to give you problem alone will be detected is well and good. And I have also emphasized in one of the classes that people also have looked at all these fringe patterns has piece of art. In fact, uh, Professor Durelli has made uh, significant contributions in looking at fringe patterns like this. So, my interest is uh, all of you please just note down some of this reference details, you do not have to write the full reference. You know he has a paper in uh, uh, applied mechanics, developments in theoretical and applied mechanics in 1970. This maybe you may not be in a position to get it, but at least the experimental mechanics will be able to get it. So, you write down this experimental mechanics and write the page numbers and the year, you do not have to write the title of the article, you can easily search it based on the reference. There is another paper in experimental mechanics on art, science, beauty and the experimentalist. So, you know people have written not one paper, three papers he has written and variety of fringe patterns he has shown and it is very interesting, because you know when you are looking at optical techniques, you should also look at the other side of it. There is beauty attached to it, lot of quality information that you can get out of it. So, what you need is you need to have some of these references, you should not just focus only on your stress analysis, you should also know related information that makes your learning lot more enjoyable and purposeful. And we will see in the next class, how material research, see if you look at any scientific advancement, it is the invention of new materials that contribute to it. And what we would look at is, in which way experimental mechanics has gained because of material research. Every advancement of science, you know if you look at heart walls, it has a route from uh, your space technology, they had uh, titanium based alloys, which had uh, which are also found to be bio compatible, that so percolates when you do high tech research, it percolates down to human suffering alleviation. 
So, we will see material research development, how it has helped experimental mechanics in the next class.